Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a slightly twisted female. I'm your host, Brittany Rue, and I'm joined today by the lovely Carol, who I featured in my recent discussion with Buck Angel and the follow up video. Carol has done some really, uh, I think, interesting and important work to sort of expose this true trans narrative as a formally trans identifying female herself, who's now a D-trans butch lesbian, um, well, has always been a butch lesbian, but is now D-trans. <laughs> <laughs> Even while she was trans, I think um, I'm really excited to hear from her and the insight that she has. So if you guys will welcome Carol. Carol, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course. So I guess let's just get started with um, where your trans journey started and, you know, maybe talk to us a little bit about, you know, the experiences of being a gender nonconforming butch lesbian and how maybe this made you particularly vulnerable to the rhetoric of trans ideology and gender ideology. Okay. Well, that's one of the reasons I've been public, even though I was an adult transitioner, I started my transition at 33 and, um, I'm 43 now. I started my detransition in 2019, so I was about 39. Um, I well, yeah, it's my my detransition. Detransitioning for me was just stopping injecting myself with tea. That's it. <laughs> That's what it was, you know. And and going back to just identifying as a female. But um, I, the reason I've been public is because I know that that for butch lesbians specifically. Mm -hmm this idea of of being trans is like um it's just so pervasive and it catches us so easily because we are we are gender non-conforming and we've been most of us have been very gender non-conforming since childhood right. and we've gotten a lot of grief for it since childhood so we grow up feeling that we are very different and that we are somehow not really women. I mean, it's just such a, it's such a normal experience with butch lesbians that it, it's, it's ridiculous that it's used to say that we're trans or that any woman's trans because they feel that way. Right. And so I got my first exposure to the idea of trans was actually when I was 21. Um, 2001, I live in California. And if you know anything of the history of, trans trans ide ideology transsexual beliefs um especially in the gay community that stuff came out of san francisco san francisco yeah. was the hub right and so the ground zero for the ground season. zero exactly it started and it started pretty early but i would say it really started blowing up in the in the lesbian community in the mid 90s okay and so i heard about it in 2001 when i first came out as a lesbian right and i didn't I didn't come out as a butch lesbian or anything. I just, I just was. People called me that, but I was like, whatever, you know, just a lesbian. But it seems like overnight, suddenly all of my butch friends just suddenly identifying as trans. All of them. I'm like, what the hell is happening, right? And I'm like, yeah. I asked one of my friends, I was like, what do you mean? You're tra what does trans mean? And what do you mean? And she basically said, well, I have the, I have the brain of a, a guy and a female body because. Right of all these things and she lists off all these things and I'm like oh my god that's all those things for me too you know mm -hmm. and um and so I just kind of fell into it then and believed that I was trans because it, it explained why I was different and I also grew up in a very religious very homophobic family right. um and I grew up in a very conservative area I grew up um with in the agricultural area that was very conservative and very hostile towards homosexuals and i got a lot of shit there so i just didn't like myself. <laughs> yeah i didn't i you know i thought there was something wrong with me right right um, and i fell into it um i did try to transition at 23 and uh the gatekeeping was really stringent but when they talk about this good old gatekeeping it consisted of basically more hoops to jump through. That's all. There was right. no actual help to maybe help you resolve your gender dysphoria without transition. It was, oh, so you want to transition? Yeah, you sound like you're you're trans. Oh, yeah, you meet the criteria because I did meet the criteria, right? right. And right. Um, basically, the gender specialist I saw was just basically like, here's all these hoops you have to jump through, and I was like, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And the reason I couldn't is because 
they demanded that you live as your desired gender for a year before giving you any hormones or anything. Mm -hmm. And that meant you had to go by male pronouns, male name, and use male spaces. As a woman, I was like, are you joking? Right. I can't use male spaces. That's dangerous. Right, right, right. And so I just, I just left angry. I just left enraged, but I never resolved anything. Right. You know, I don't know. Have you ever uh, listened to Richie, who's a D trans man uh, from the UK who had bottom surgery? He went, oh, I, I love Richie. Yeah. Richie's yeah. great. So to me, he really refutes this whole thing that you're talking about that what you just said that, oh, if we just get back to the good old days with the, you know, the more stringent gatekeeping, you know, that'll resolve everything. And it's like, you know, Richie is, is to me the, the, who I, the example that I point to with how much that's, that's not even accurate because Richie talks about having, I mean, for upwards of like a two, three, four, I think it was like almost five years. He was yeah, in a long therapy. Time. He was in the queue. He was, you know, doing a lot. He really did things in like incremental steps, like started off with therapy, started and then went to social transition and then, you know, incrementally then in, introduced, you know, uh, estradiol, progesterone and, you know, step by step all the way till finally. And he even at one point when they were talking about doing bottom surgery, he said he wanted to withdraw. And they said, if you do that, if you uh, we will have to just kick you out of the queue altogether, you know, because yeah. this is really for people who want to go all the way. He's like, oh, well, I better hop on it because I don't want to yeah. have to start all over again. I mean, in fairness, in Richie's situation, I think they were there. They're the going by the more. um affirming model right and i think the 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 aff affirmation only model has really made it worse right. and but if you even if you go back to the original model it's still profoundly homophobic yes. profoundly sexist and right. it's still transitioning homosexuals more than anybody else like i mentioned this in my video that the true or the this last one i did with um a swag sylvia um we talked about this true trans thing, and I, I mentioned that, um, according to Harry Benjamin himself, which was the founder of W Path, um, mm -hmm. it used to be the Harry Benjamin something or other, and then it changed to W Path. <laughs> Men um, love putting their name on. It. <laughs> he he basically his his criteria was a homosexual dude. Right. That was his ultimate true trans, right? right. And so it's like. And I was just listening, actually, you know, I usually, before I talk to somebody, I'll like quick binge watch their stuff. And I was already listening. I was, you know, listening to you as sort of research for my um, Buck Angel interview. And what you, you also talked about Harry Benjamin, you know, uh, transitioning one of the first women ever. I guess she was, had a lot of money and, you know, she, I mean, I don't know if she was the first first, I mean, it's hard to kind of keep these things out, but one right. of the major first that he particularly handled. Yeah. And I'm sure just one, you know, at least among one of yeah. the earliest that we've seen. And then she ended up dying of alcoholism, even after having, you know, transition and all these things. And I just think that like, like you said, even if we, you know, have a non-affirmation uh, model where we're challenging people, I, I, I said it before. And I, I think that a really underappreciated aspect to transition is uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. So it's like these obsessive thoughts. And once Absolutely. you've latched on to the idea that you're trans, it's like you have this idea. And I've talked to a lot of you transitioners that it's like, once I get here, then I'll finally be free and happy. And I can finally live the way that I want. Well, transition is such a very base level um, idea for humans, right? This idea to become better to go through the fire and come out a phoenix or whatever like you know right. it does have this rejuvenating kind of born again thing going on it it's religious i mean it has a religious thing to it and it always has i think right. yeah no absolutely so tell me a little bit just about like the lesbian scene in the 90s you know i've talked i don't know if you know vf555 uh, you know, was like just really active in the sort of club scene in the 90s. And she talks a lot about how it used to be, you know, we had super gender nonconformity, like, you know, um, like Susie the Band. She's all these different people who, um, uh, you know, like, I mean, Prince, you know, where it was like, okay to be, we were finally at a point that it was gender nonconforming was like, 
cool. How do we go from that acceptance to, you know, how do you think to just being like, no, you're actually now a man. Like what are the narratives that you heard when, uh, you know, in the nineties and as you were kind of coming into yourself as, as like a newly out lesbian, what were the things that you were being? Well, told? I can't speak for the nineties. It wasn't necessarily out then. I came out in like 2001, 2000. Okay. So yeah. And, um, I was not in the big cities. So I could not tell you what was going on so much there. Although there was a lot of cross pollination with my smaller town. Um, yeah. just because that's the way it works. Um, I think the thing is, is I think this, this trans, trans and transition has always existed in the gay community to a certain extent, because like I said, transitioning gay men was basically who was transitioned way back in the day. It was gay men. And so we always, like, even when I first came out before trans was really a huge thing, there was a transsexual dude, but he was a really effeminate gay dude who got so much shit that's like everybody just was like, yeah, I know why he's doing it and felt bad for him. Right. So they, they always existed in our community, which is, I think, why gay people like accepted this a lot more when it got when it just kind of came on. And and, you know, it, it, it's been a slow burn in the gay community. It just didn't drop like maybe it has in heterosexual society, right. you know. And of course, if you throw enough money behind anything you're going to blow it up. And social media, I think, really blew it up, right? Because now you have- Oh, totally, totally. YouTube, YouTube especially was a, it's a, it was a huge way to blow up the transsexual thing. Because mm-hmm. you had, I remember way back when YouTube was just starting, all of the trans-identified females on there talking about their transition. You know, so it's like that was your first exposure really to it if you didn't hear about it in person. No, that's so true. Even I remember like when I started this channel, just looking up, you know, and and you're so right. And it's like, I feel like, you know, there's such a beauty in the democratization of access to media. Whereas before you had to be this big, like, you know, media conglomerate and they got to like cherry pick, you know, who would be the reporters and it was all very orchestrated. And now we have access to this sort of democratized media format, which is great. On the, you know, the one hand we can hear, I mean, you and I would not be having this conversation right now. You know, we, I wouldn't be able to connect with the people that I have, but on the other hand, it's like anybody can now be an authority on stuff, you know, and you hear these like, you know, these like 22 year olds who are like, you know, ask me anything, you know, I'm doing a question and answer as if they're like this, like expert on trans and they talk about as if, you know, it's this liberating thing. And I, I always talk about how with sororities and fraternities when they haze people, when you have to go through a lot to achieve something, you're much more likely to report about that thing with like this glowing admiration. Like it was so worth it. I'm so glad I did it. Cause you have to justify mentally why you went through. Also, there's just, shit. there's just the sunk cost fallacy. I right. Think. So many, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised at the vast majority of people who go through transition regret it but they're not going to admit to themselves they regret it. And they're not going to admit to anybody else because how can you? Right. I can't imagine regretting it after you've gone through like all the surgeries. That's Especially horrible. after you've gone out of your way to basically like bully everyone around you into getting on board. And you were like, you have to, you have to sit there and sell it. Like I'm, this, I'm I, so sure this is what I want. I have to say detransitioning is the most humbling experience of my life mm. because I knew I had to, admit I was wrong. I knew I had to accept what I did and accept my fault in it. And, you know, one of my biggest regrets really is that I drug my family along with it. And right. that is like, I'll never forgive myself for that. It's that's wrong. I shouldn't have done that. You know, it's like with all the mental health issues, with everything that was going on, I feel like, God, you should have at least looked there and stopped, <laughs> you know, right. Right. but Unfortunately, I bought into the idea that you'd become a better person, right? And I wasn't i wasn't a great person at the time, and because I was very mentally ill, and well, I wasn't getting the help I needed. Of, it's like the patient-led treatment plan. Like you, you just said, man, I wish I would have looked into other things, but was that, was, you, was that your responsibility? It's like, isn't that why we have like experts? Well, that, and-, and you know, that is, that is the thing that I think we get hit with a lot as detransitioners from almost from everybody if you're an adult, right? Like even the the gender criticals who are like on there trying to like, you know, save the children and stuff, even they will, they when they hold the line that an adult can do what they want, I feel right. like they're saying the same shit that the TRAs are saying. 
right. right? Because they're not understanding that the system is not actually helping vulnerable or mentally ill people. They're making money off of us. Right. You right. know, it's much, you're going to make a lot more money off of just giving somebody all these surgeries and hormones than you are actually trying to discuss what's actually wrong with them. Right. And the other thing is with major surgeries and major operation, the, the, the medical community is supposed to gatekeep that. They right. tell people no all the time for right. all kinds of reasons, right? I can't just walk into a hospital and tell them that I feel like, you know, I have cancer in my hand and they need to remove it for me. Like right. they, they're going to go, well, no, we're going to diagnose you. And then we're going to tell you what the best treatment is. Now, now you can refuse the treatment. Right. But, right, but you can't demand it. Right. Yeah, you, can refuse, you, know. you know, and it's like, and I think that, you know, when the argument of it, you know, and I've really been on the fence about this because sometimes I'm like, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm so cautious to call in for more government oversight on, on telling, you know, citizens what they can do. And I remember I was listening to you in your conversation with Sylvia and you kind of expressed something similar. You're like, you know, I, I'm not quick to go say that adults can't do something. But I think the thing is, it's not so much of adults can't do something. It's doctors can't do whatever they want, right? Exactly. It's, you know, adults it's can go and try to get whatever, but a doctor has the right to say, I'm not going to perform or give treatments that are unhelpful, that do more damage than good, and, and that are inherently uh, exploitative. And I've always said, I've always said, I'm not, I would never want to pass a law outline transition, right. even though I think it's disgusting and horrible. But where I do object is I do think it is not a medical treatment. It's not a mental health treatment, and it should not be. That's where I want it to go away. It, you brought now, it up in your conversation. Yeah. Like, it's like the lizard man, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so it's man. like, look, if, if a person with this severe gender dysphoria goes to a therapist, transition should not be the option at all. Right. Help should be the option. And if that person refuses the help and wants to go outside of that and go like every other person does who has wants plastic surgery and goes right. and has plastic surgery, more power to them. Adults can have plastic surgery. Again, I hate plastic surgery in that whole industry, mm -hmm. but adults and, and adult. acknowledging <laughs> it for what it is. This is a yeah. cosmetic. This is a useless surgery. But if it's something that you want a certain bizarre look, you know, then then you can do that, but understand that this is not any kind of a, and it's like, they have to almost like create this like idea of like treatment to allow, I, I, it's really all of this is tailored to allow doctors to experiment on the bodies of people to see what, what can we do? What can we figure out? Well, how, you know, how can we play with someone's endocrinology to, I mean, that, you know, that's how it started. Out. If you go back and look at the history of it, it was, it was some crazy ass fringe quack doctors that was it wanted to experiment and had people willing to be experimented on. Right. You know, right. and what did is, you believe you were going to get out of transition? Like what, how, when you imagine the sort of point of when I, you know, finally meet my goals, you know, like you talked about uh, your family being, Christian and homophobic, you know, did you feel like then you could kind of live a heterosexual lifestyle, you know, and then you could not have to deal with the sort of pressure of being honestly, a, a gay woman? Honestly, I just, since I was a teenager, an early teenager, like 13, 12 or 13, I had really bad sex dysphoria mm -hmm. and gender dysphoria, but I would say more sex dysphoria, which means a real uncomfortability with your female body, your anatomy, your genitalia, like right. really bad. And so I just wanted that to go away. I didn't want to feel that way anymore. And I thought transition would help that. And, and when I started my transition, I really, my goal was to have all the surgeries. Right. Um, but as I got into it, and as I went to what is considered the best and specialist doctor in San Francisco, right. um, I realized that these doctors are scary. Like I went in for a consultation and this guy, I swear he was on drugs. Like he wasn't odd. Okay. He, he had nothing I asked for. Like I asked for just normal medical like information. Right. And he was like, oh, well, you know, he just kept him in and hawing, wouldn't give me any medical information. And then he started to look through his phone to see if he had pictures of people <laughs> he'd operated on. And I was like, Oh wow. I was like, 
<laughs> oh shit. And you know, <laughs> this is people, not legit. No, but no, but this guy is legit. That's what scared right. me, right? And so the thing that really struck me was that well, this is this is where the age does make a difference. This is where an adult does make a difference, I think. Mm -hmm. I was old enough to have already had some medical stuff. I was old enough to have taken care of grandparents that had medical stuff. I knew how the medical field and industry it's supposed worked. supposed to look like, what it's yes. supposed to be. Like. It's supposed to be. So then when I went into this, I went, oh, quackery. This is not good. I'm not putting my body on the table here. Good. You know, I did have my mastectomy, um, but that's... You did, uh... I did, yeah. And that's a... That wasn't as... I mean, it's a more simpler, it's a sim more simple. Oh, it's definitely surgery, so. not as serious. As yeah. And also it's not necessarily like, I wouldn't call it, I call it a, a um, cosmetic mastectomy because it's not really a full on mastectomy like with cancer where they take like everything mm -hmm. tissue is left. And you, with the doctor I went to, I was allowed to kind of tweak what I wanted with it. So I never okay. had the nipple grafts or anything like that. So okay. I actually don't have as severe a situation as maybe some other women have. Okay. Because I had a lot more tissue left over. So it ended up just being like an extreme reduction at this point, okay. you know? Right. Yeah. Right. So talk about a little bit uh, of your gatekeeping process. I mean, how did you, when you first were like, okay, I'm ready to sort of take the next step. Uh, did you start with a gender therapist? Um, so, you know, that's, that's, what's funny back in 2002, you had to see a gender specialist when it came to 2014, 13, you didn't, I mean, California was pretty much a, you could walk into a Planned Parenthood and get hormones. You didn't need anything at that point. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I, I was still wanting to see a therapist. Like I still thought, well, I want to go the correct route and I want to make sure that this is right for me. And like, I was really coming to it. This is the rare thing I think with me is my mind wasn't exactly set. And that's why, like, I am so angry at mental health. Right. Um, and so distrusting at this point is because my mind wasn't really set. I was open to an alternative because, like, honestly, I didn't want to go through the surgeries, but I really thought that was my only option. Right. So it would have been hard for them to challenge you and actually poke around long enough to get you to, you know. It wouldn't have been hard, actually. Right. Right. And so I, I went to a therapist, just any therapist. You can go to any therapist. I went to a therapist and who had had experience working with supposedly lgbt um which probably was a mistake but i didn't know that at the time right but i was so scared of being with a homophobic therapist that i didn't want to do that so right. i went to her and she basically just kind of affirmed me and didn't really ask many questions and even there was even one point i brought up i was like because i was kind of scared i was stepping up to have my mastectomy and i said do you think i'm doing this because of like my hatred of my mom <laughs> like <laughs> Oh, and she's like, like he's deep down kind of like yeah you were actually I mean, I, in touch with what was going on i guess i kind of was but it's very painful yeah. like you don't want to really approach it right? right and she was like oh no i've 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 seen women like that no you you're not that no <laughs> like oh okay <laughs> i'm like let's not you know ask any more questions or expand on it it's just like no no, <laughs> no. and oh, you know no. i think about i think about the whole I think about the mastectomy thing and I think about what she could have said that or what she could have started a conversation around that really would have helped me maybe kind of get to the root to it and kind of resolve it without having surgery. And I mm -hmm. think one of the a, a good question is, has there any ever been a point in your life you were OK with your breasts ever, even if it was for a second? When was that and what right. was happening? Right. Because it gets you to kind of engage with something else other than just the hatred, because I don't think we hate it all the time. Right, right. And, th and that was the case for me too. I, I didn't hate my breast all the time, just right. the majority of the time. <laughs> so it was well, good. You know, I, had, I had seen this one uh, in, in one of my, like, I think my like most viewed video, it's just a compilation of detransitioner. It was just sort of talking about their regret. And there is this one, oh, it's so sad. This one young lesbian who, um, God, it's like, it's hard to listen to her and not like tear up a little bit, but she was like, you know, I realized when I was home and I would be naked in front of the mirror, I didn't hate my breasts. You know, it was when I went out in the world and I knew that how I was being perceived wasn't the way I wanted to be perceived, you know? And, and it was like, I, I don't want, like, it's hard for me to paraphrase. I don't remember exactly what she said, but it was something similar. She was like, no, I realized I, it, I didn't hate my breasts all the time. Like you just said, you know, there's times where I was like, happy when I was home in my body, but it was, you know, it was just the perception that I wanted to elicit from people that made me want to 
I've removed them or, or yeah. whatever. Now, now the hatred of my breasts really did come from outside. It really did, you know, right. but I didn't, I didn't really understand that because I bought into the gender dysphoria thing. Right. I bought right. into basically what Buck says there. I have this condition and it's, it's gender dysphoria. Let's not think any further. Right. It's a stopgap like that. That's like, I have a real issue with, with the exception, like, and, and I, and so many of the gender criticals do this. So many of even the lesbians do this. Oh, well they have gender dysphoria. So right. lots of people have issues like, like there's eating disorders, there's body dysmorphia, there's, what there's is OCD. What really fully mean? It's like, we've got it. You can't just slap a term. Oh, gender dysphoria. They're uncomfortable in their gender. And first of all, it would be sex dysphoria. Yeah, it's, it, well, because, I mean, I guess the, the, the difference I draw is sex dysphoria is really a discomfort with your physical sex, your body. Gender dysphoria mm -hmm. is the uncomfortability with being perceived as like a, a, a woman or a man or something got like it. that. Yeah. So yeah. I, because some people, some women I know have just had issues with the gender part, their place in society. And others have had really a lot of issue with their sex itself. Right. Most of the time it's both, but. Yeah, and I've heard things, you know, I guess it's like the stone butch who, you know, doesn't really want, like, you know, to be touched sexually, like, doesn't want to be touched sexually. And I think that that probably, you know, is rooted in what you're talking about, uh, you know, sex dysphoria and just that, like, sort of inherent discomfort. And it's a shame because we just, we don't have a lot. It's like, it's a shame because it's like the internet could have been such a useful tool for, you know, bringing together these communities of, you know, women to actually talk and sort of work through these feelings in a positive way. And, you know, unfortunately it just went the opposite way. It just sparked this firestorm of social contagion and self-harm, yeah. you know, that it, it just, it didn't, you know, it didn't need to happen. Um, at what point, so, so, when you you started on testosterone first, how long were you on T for? Four years. Four years. Um, and at how, what were the kind of side effects for you? What are things that you experienced while on it? Um. Well, I experienced a lot of um, vaginal atrophy and pain starting at about two years, which is actually rare. It usually starts earlier, mm -hmm. but about two years is when it really started to become uh, bad and. I experienced, um, towards the end, I was having a lot of like weird dizzy spills. Like if I just stood up too fast, I'd like want to fall over. And I just, I didn't even dawn on me that it could be like the tea. Yeah. Um, it caused, it caused my mental health to deteriorate way, way worse. <laughs> like the anxiety got really out of hand and I don't know if it was the tea or not, but I feel like it kind of broke my brain a little bit because like my anxiety was got so bad on T and then I went on medication. And even now to this day, it is, it can be really, really bad. And it was not like that before. Right. And yeah. um, the other thing is actually towards the end, my, my cholesterol was almost to the point where I needed to be medicated for it. And I was approaching like, you know, the pre-diabetic stages too. That's I, interesting. Do you think there's a relationship? Well, here's what's funny. So when I started, my, my levels were normal. Right. Four years later, my levels are getting to the point where I need medication. Wow. And if anything, and TRAs, trans, trans believers will say, well, if you leave a, live a healthy lifestyle, that won't be the case. My lifestyle was actually much healthier. <laughs> like Don't I was men tend to have issues with cholesterol more often. I'm not hundred huh? percent. I, I was, you know, now that you're saying that I don't men tend to have issues with cholesterol more often i know that they have um, well, that's, and that's another one of the issues. things that's the things the doctor will even tell you oh these are male levels how can you know that and say that when i'm a female right it's not i'm not a male so you can't right. and i'm injecting a poison so it's like you can't <laughs> it's not right. the same thing anyways at, at four years my 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 blood my blood you know uh tests were not coming back great and then i stopped tea and i went back three months after stopping tea for blood work and everything had dropped back down to normal three months. Oh, see, there you go. That's a mate. Like I couldn't believe it. And then that made me super mad at doctors because right. I was like, those fuckers knew this and right. no one told me anything. Right. I even right. asked doctors, it could it be the tea? I asked doctors, could it be the testosterone? I've never heard of such a thing. It's yeah. bullshit. They've had it's to bullshit. heard of such a thing. 
Exolanthic talks about the fact that, you know, if, if estrogen, I mean, if testosterone works on the vocal cords, you know, in the way that they do, right. You have to assume that it's working on, you know, the vocal cords, uh, you know, ligaments, it's working on other tissues in the body in a similar way. And it would be logical to assume that it's then working on things like, you know, the heart muscle and, and thinning, I think of like the heart chambers and things like that. And like you said, we know that men typically, I, 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 pretty sure that men typically struggle with uh cholesterol issues because they do heart disease in men it is uh a huge problem you know so it's there's just like it's like we're sitting here trying to get these cosmetic effects and obviously if it's changing these things on the superficial level what are what else is going on inside your body that you can't see that it's changing yeah. and it has a big impact on um i don't know you know cat catinson Mm -hmm. So Kat Kattenson is a D trans woman who, um, you know, she was a singer and she was on T I think for two years. And she talks a lot of like interesting things about like her, her sexual libido, her drive went up really a lot. She had just these sort of like more aggressive behavior. Um, and I've also heard, and I don't know if you have, any experience with this. And I wonder if this would explain Buck Angel, but I've heard that when people take, you know, testosterone, like, like she said that, you know, she's a heterosexual woman, but when she got on testosterone, she started having feelings, you know, of sexual attraction towards women that she had never experienced before. And I don't know if you've heard Dylan Mulvaney is now, what, I guess a year into using estrogen. And he talks about now for the first time having experiences of being sexually attracted to women. It's almost weird. It's like, I've heard of like homosexual. Yeah. I've heard of it too. Hormones. I've heard it quite often and it is, yeah. it is interesting. I wonder yeah. what's going on there. I mean, yeah. I think I I've made a video on, on what, like my take on why butch lesbians transition and become gay men. Uh, when they say gay men, they mean they'll still have sex with other FTMs and maybe men too. Right. Um, but this is a phenomenon. It definitely happens. Now, it could be the T. It definitely could be the T or the estrogen could. But yeah. my thoughts on the lesbian perspective is it has more to do with validation mm -hmm. and it has more to do with um, still wanting to be heterosexual, right? right? Because the internalized homophobia is a huge component to why homosexuals transition. Right. And yes, I know they're saying they're gay. But they know they're women and they're having sex with men like mom wanted right. them to, right? And so I think it's still a way to engage with, with heterosexuality the way that they, they feel is correct. Right. And T makes that possible because you're so, your libido is so high that you were willing to do things that you wouldn't normally do. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause it's just so, you know, I remember cause like you and I kind of interacted a little bit under your buck video, just about, you know, trying to understand what, cause you, your, your assertion is you don't believe that buck is bisexual. You believe that she's a lesbian woman who's engaging with bisexuality, you know, for, uh, different reasons. Right. I mean, I don't know. I don't, she maybe yeah. she is bisexual. I mean, cause that's the other component too. Maybe there are there. I think there's several things that could be happening. One is that someone could actually be bisexual, and right. that going doing the the transition enables them to kind of engage with that. Okay, right. fine, that could be totally a thing. But I also think there's a huge component happening with lesbians that really is validation because nothing is more validating than a gay man accepting you. Yeah, yeah. And no, I and totally and true. when it comes to trans identification, I don't care. Who who you are or if you have gender dysphoria or don't not the validation is a big part of it it's everything i think it really it, is i mean was there ever a point where you truly believed like i'm a man now or like was that identity pretty fragile throughout no i never i never i i was i was based in reality i knew i was a female i knew i was never gonna completely change that i was right. just trying to be comfortable with my body and that's you know. the thing. I think that it's like, this is why they predicate and hang so much importance on everybody participating because yeah. it's like, it's like, I feel like they all know deep down, like you said, it's a way to engage with heterosexuality when these like trans men, you know, uh, have sex with, you know, like biological men. 
And it's like, because deep down, it's like, you know, they all <laughs> know that this isn't fully what it is. Also, what are your thoughts on, so I don't know if you've, and if you've noticed this, right, I feel like trans identifying females are, are more cautious and seems like they're hesitant to like really call themselves men, like, you know, buck somebody who's very brazen about doing it. But I hear a lot of them saying like, I'm trans mask, like I'm trans masculine. It's like, they don't want to fully say, whereas trans identifying males are more than happy to be like, I'm a woman, I'm a biological woman. It's like, there's someone more brazen about I it. I think it depends. Um, there's a big difference between the straight people who transition and gay people who transition. Big difference. Yeah, talk about that a little. So obviously the straight dudes that transition are doing it because it's a fetish. That's right. a totally different. You cannot compare them to the homosexual ones. The right. homosexual ones are doing it because of wanting to escape their homosexuality or, you know, because they have gender dysphoria around their sexuality. And I'm not saying that it, I'm not saying that there can't become a little bit of a fetish aspect to it for everybody mm -hmm. because, and, and I was talking to a much older detransition lesbian the other day, and she, she was the first one who told me that so much effort goes, so much self-centeredness is involved in trans right. and transition. And I was like, yes, you're the first oh. one to say that, even oh. though I, I know that's the case. And, you know, I told her something that, you know, I was like, this thing particular happened. And can you believe I didn't even like, wasn't even bothered by it for four years. And she's like, no, it doesn't surprise me because you were so self-absorbed. And I'm yeah. like, right. You know, right. So there's a self-absorbed aspect, but the gay men usually do it because of the internalized homophobia. The heterosexual women are doing it oftentimes to escape trauma, to escape womanhood. And I do think that's for some, and I've known some that fully say, it was a fetish aspect for them, mm -hmm. but I still don't think it's a fetish aspect like it is for the men. Yeah. Well, I, I just know that don't paraphilias think do not impact women in the same way. And I know that there's a lot of men who get mad that we harp on AGPs and the fetishism of men, but we don't really, you know, like go so hard towards trans identifying females, but because we know that women are just simply not as, prone to paraphilia is the way that males are. I mean, they're the ones who get into all this other weird shit. Why? I'm not entirely sure, you know, yeah. but, um, yeah. And, um, shit, what else did I want to ask you? Um, for, for the heterosexual women, it really does seem like it helps it. They really feel like they can then have sex with men and engage with men on an equal level. If they're trans, yeah. that's wow. a huge component, which they're not. They can't no, ever. that's a really good <laughs> one. That's so true. Where it's like an, you don't have to sit there and be like the submissive, like, you know, bottom and all this sort of. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. That's actually probably really true. What are your thoughts on so like, did you have a community of trans identifying females while you were transitioned or were you one of the I did. Females? I did start um, my primarily my indoctrination and it is it is i really do believe it's a it's a cult and it's not it was a cult back then and it's a cult now it's the same right. fucking thing it's just a big bigger cult because of social media i was indoctrinated mostly on online okay a little bit in person back in the early 2000s but mostly online right. and um because of that i think it's easier to break out of a cult if you're just indoctrinated <laughs> online and not in person right and um there uh if you read any, any books on cult and, and people getting out of cults and stuff that they'll talk about that anyways. Um, but when I was starting my transition, I did go to a local trans support group. And um, so I was engaged a little bit. I had a trans identified friend, um, which is a woman. I had another butch lesbian. She was younger than me who was transitioning and we kind of became friends. But the thing that really struck me about this support group was the delusions. Because even yeah. though I was going into it, believing the whole different brain, you know, the right brain, wrong body shit, shit right. I still knew I was female and I still right. knew that drugs and surgery wasn't going to change that. It was going to mask it. Like I understood. I was a true transsexual, by the way. Right. Um, That's why I get mad. The whole true <laughs> trans thing. It's like their definition basically says that like basically everyone is true trans. It's like, well, anyone who's made an attempt either an attempt to like pass it's like but who hasn't what are you talking about or well like, no that's one of the things that annoys me that's, that's like the biggest one of the biggest things that annoys me about like buck angel and the truth in the true transsexuals that get passes right 
acknowledging your sex is such a freaking low bar. Why are we giving them credit for that? Like, Thank you. Everyone says, what? wow, Buck's not delusional. I'm like, what? No, she is. She yes, absolutely she is. is delusional. Uh, yeah, she is. Like, what all, did you not get? <laughs> all trans-identified people are delusional. They believe that they have a brain that's different than their body. There's no proof for that. That's a belief system. Right. Plain and simple. So I don't know what I was originally talking about. I don't know. (laughs) I looked at a comment really fast. And then I like, (laughs) but um, yeah, no. And it's like, you know, um, you talk about, oh, one of the things that you you talked about was, I, I just think porn is such a huge component in this. And I think it's, porn is a big reason why Buck harps on this so heavily and how much she is, you know, the reason why I think she clings to this with such an iron fist and why we all need to be really side eye. Anybody, any trans, any gender criticals out there who still really want to hold on to the fact that no, there are some really true transsexuals who are helpful and, and they're doing the real work to protect. But they're still pushing, they're still pushing a toxic idea though. Right. Do do you have an issue with the base idea? And also, I have to I have to say this. When you were talking with Buck and you mm-hmm. played my little bit of the video, which yeah. I wish you would have played a little bit more because that looked that really I looked know. like I was like totally blaming Buck. And I don't no, know. I know that think, I was like fuck do you because think- I should have actually put down a timestamp and I, I thought I'd gotten the right part and I was like and I could think- tell that now- you were getting like mad so I was like let me just end it but you're right I'm sorry I'll ask your- so many better clips no no it's okay I'll ask your opinion do you think my whole video came off as blaming Buck for my no opinion? okay I didn't because I didn't want it to right because- no I don't blame Buck for my transition. There's a lot that went into it. And I take responsibility for like my fucking part too. Like I no, said. No, but it's like she acknowledged, and this is what? why I was trying to talk to her. I was like, if she acknowledges that there, this is social contagion, because I said, do you acknowledge that the social contagion is an aspect? She's like, oh, of course. And it's oh, like, but only for kids. Right, right. And I was like, okay. So logically then, like, what Carol's talking about that you're the most visible person who's talking about how great it is. You're talking directly to other, you know, these butch lesbians who look up to you as like, wow, I see myself in you. And these kids who are like, I see myself in you and you're talking to them. You always says, she, she always says, I don't think that, you know, people should transition, but it was the best thing that I ever did in her like Popeye voice. It's like, all right. What is that? supposed like, <laughs> I mean, cause so the point, really the point of my video was to just, and it wasn't so much for, I mean, it wasn't so much for me as it was just because I've become very, very um, active and very centered in lesbian community and trying to build lesbian community and help other butch lesbians and detrans lesbians, right? Okay. So my whole point was, this was a individual, and she wasn't the only one, right. but she was a really bright star in that situation. She had a huge influence. She brought a lot of messaging. Like you know? one other, I, I you know, I... Like, I can't, like, whenever someone asks me to name some, like, trans men, some trans identifying females, like, I'm like, Buck Angel. Um. And then, like, Buck, I'm like, who's the Juno one? And the other thing, the other thing I, the other thing I wonder about Buck, though, is like, and Buck will say, um, I already know what she'll say. She'll say, well, I was talking about myself, my own experience. I always only talk about my own experience. Why? Why right. did you feel the need to tell everybody about your own experience? Right. Why didn't you just get on with your life? I right. don't understand why you needed why you needed all this validation. Right. And that's what it is. That's what trans advocacy is. It's validation for me because I'm delusional. I know I'm delusional deep down, but I need everybody to play along. Right. And she has to sell it. And you know, I think why they're really mad and they're really trying to rein it in. It's not so much to like protect it. It's to, it's to save it. It's like, shit, this has gone so far. So many people have latched on to it and they've taken their narrative where they wanted to go. And now rightfully people are fine. It's drawing way too much attention to this bullshit thing that has always kind of like been there and people are now pushing back. And it's like, we've got to, that's why I say gen spec a lot of this true trans, true trans is really not about protecting or, you know, people or eradicating gender ideology. It's about preserving it, actually. It's saying, no, 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 yeah. no, no. It's And, you know, I have to say, I used to disagree with you and Karen on this. I used to disagree with your criticisms of GenSpec. Yeah. I've since changed my mind because yeah. I've had a lot more doings with them. And I've, I've seen some stuff and I'm like, 
yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that. I was on the fence too. When Karen first was doing it, I'm like, I hear you. I hear you. And because I was always coming from the, because I'm a mother. So, the, you yeah. know, I need to take like a perspective from parents. I'm like, you know, but these parents are, they're doing and, their best. They don't want to scare their kid away. And, and I like, have to say, I kind of understand, like, I, I can, I can understand their, if they're trying to do it from a strategic standpoint, you can't come out and just say the whole thing's bullshit because you will turn off most people. Like, I get it. Right. But God, at the same time, I'm just like, for me personally, I have to call it bullshit. And I think and sometimes you don't you want to call you it bullshit. To. <laughs> you because know? my problem is by not just saying this is bullshit, trust me, it's bullshit. When you say, oh, when you like, okay, fuck. when you like, uh, what's her name? Ayana? I keep saying calling her Ayana Assad, and everyone gets mad. It's like, that's not her name, whatever the fuck her name is from Jen Speck. She was like in the um, uh, affirmation nation. She they did this whole the whole first half of the movie. I'm like, this is great, this is great, totally. And then she fucking ruins it by saying, you know, and for every one person who transition helps, it hurts another, or for every one child, transition helps. A hundred are hurt. I was like, what? No. Because the problem is when people hear that, they're going to go, oh, well, I met one child. Everybody's that one special child. And that's the help. problem with continuing the true transsexual. Yes. That's the problem with continuing. They have gender dysphoria. Like it's this, like it's this, this mental illness. It's like this mental health thing that's out of the reach of everything else. And I'm like, right. I'm like gender dysphoria is on the same page as everything else, folks. It's right. no different. It's it's a person's it, person's mental health, emotional trauma based response to shit that happened to them. That's all it is, you know. And also, sometimes I think there's there's like there's so many like uh, what's his name, um, Joshua Moon, who's the founder of Kiwi Farms, has a really good podcast called Mad at the Internet on Odyssey. Oh, and he, he does. Calls- yeah, it's yeah, it's oh. definitely worth checking out. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's cool. funny. But he talks about this whole trans thing as a rat king, and I think even if we look at what a rat king, where it's like you know, when a bunch of rats huddle together because it's cold, and then they try to pull apart after like a week of sleeping together, they're all their tails are all tied together. And if they don't get them untied, they they always find them dead. And this it's like a whole bunch of like rats with their tails tied together, and it's like that's kind of what this trans thing has become. And I think even from a, a you know, if you look at different, different trans people clearly have such an array of reasons. It's like for Buck, I see a lot of addiction issues. I also see a lot of histrionic personality disorder. It's like attention at all costs. Dylan Mulvaney is another one with histrionic issues. Like whatever I could do to get attention, I'm doing it. I don't care if it's negative attention. I don't care if it's critical you know then you have people like um uh you know like shapeshifter and i think you similarly came from more conservative families and were really internalizing a lot of this like homophobia and and just trying to reconcile like who you are in the sort of like framework of of your family's value systems and things like that and i just think like you know, and then and then Richie talks about obsessive compulsive thinking, and I think that in oh, his case, he had on to the idea. The 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 compulsive obsessive thinking part of it is such a key element to to oh, trans really. identification. It really, really is. Uh, even for AGPs, uh, if you really want to help these dudes, because mm-hmm. we should actually be trying to get these dudes out of this, because yeah. these these dudes don't do anybody a service, right? And so. If you really wanted to help, it would be addressing that 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 monkey mind. They ruin you know? families because most of these AGPs, the ideology of autogynephilia is it usually, whereas like for a homosexual, transsexual, they always report around like four or five. Those are like the little kids who are like, I'm a girl, you know. But AGP usually starts to show itself uh, and materialize around late teenagerhood and early 20s. And they usually push it down for years and years and years, live these very masculine lives, start families, they're heterosexual. And then it'll kind of start to spring up later in, in, you know, middle life where they're like, yeah, I don't know, like going through their wife's stuff when she's at work and like playing with her lingerie. And it's destroying lives because yeah. these men have families they have that's that's the other part of the trans stuff that i think that people seem to miss and and you know what i even detransitioners are guilty of missing this and but also i feel like a lot of times it's not our place to talk about it but it's the it's the impact this has on families you right. know our transition was devastating to our families um and you know 
whatever, whatever, whatever your family unit was, you know, it was hard on your families and your friends and your community. You were a detriment to your community. I'm sorry you were, you know, right. I'll use an, I'll use an example of something that was dishonest. Oh, and also my belief is that trans identification at the core is a lie and we should not be encouraging lying and dishonesty in our society, especially a society that has to, that has to have trust. Right. So I'll use an example for of, of, of a thing I am not proud of. I, when I was trans identified, I worked at a youth psychiatric facility. In a youth psychiatric facility, it was co-ed, but when it came to sleeping arrangements, it was sex segregated, obviously. They're not going to make <laughs> girls and boys sleep together and yeah. showers and stuff, you know, but common areas were together. Well, the rules were you did have to make sure you did have to go into the showers and and make sure that you kept an eye on the kids, right? And only women could go in where the girls were showering and only men could go in where the boys were showering. Right. Where was I supposed to go? Right. I was living stealth. And I knew that if, and that's the other thing, if I, I knew if I wasn't stealth, I would be treated just the same right. as, as a woman. And I didn't want to be treated that way. Right. So I was living stealth. So I was dishonest there. Now I avoided the showers. I avoided ever having to interact with the boys because right. I felt like it wasn't wrong. It wasn't right to do that. And so yeah. I managed to get out of it. But the thing is, how many trans identified people think I'm a guy now, I should go into whatever space. And like, that's that right there would be violating those boys. Right. And on the opposite, if a guy came in and was identifying as a woman, that's violating those girls, right. because you're not supposed to have the opposite sex in those spaces. Right. And so I like, I think about those kind of things a lot. I swear to God, I and uh, you know people can disagree with me, but I still feel like trans-identified females still seem to have so much more pause. Like the fact that you would even stop and like this is just wrong. That it's like that I just don't see that sort of self-policing with these trans-identifying males. It's like yes, an opportunity to affirm myself. Oh, I can go into the YMCA. It's like the whole Julie Jaman thing. Were they the trans identifying male who's like helping little girls get dressed out of their bathing suits? Like, bro, well, you know, that goes, that just goes back to male privilege though. Yeah, totally. That's just all it is. There's, there's male privilege and female privilege. And, and as someone who was in a trans support group, you better believe that room was split right along sex blinds, just like every other damn room. Totally. The men that came in there were loud and obnoxious and the women never got to talk. And the one time I challenged a dude on something he fucking like got hostile like that. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. Do they ever, do they ever tell you that you have male privilege? Oh like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Love, we, no, we, <laughs> we had to be quiet and let them speak because they were the women. Oh my fucking God. I remember when I first got into all of this and I was like talking to like my first detransitioners and my jaw was on the floor and just talking about like how like they see, yeah, all these like men are like, oh, you know, you're, yeah, you're like, yeah, you're being like a misogynist. Like, you know who has a lot to say? Patriarchal. About like, bro, what? You know who's talked a lot about that and her experience as a young teenager and as GNC centric? She talks oh, a lot yeah. about. No, that's who it was. It was yeah. Benji. It was Benji. And, and, she, and she was also in like a super super woke. <laughs> I forget where, but like you know, in Canada, that you know, a very well known trans identified male, right? Who's a grown ass dude being creepy and just weird with teenagers, you know? Oh, yeah. and that's the other thing too. When I was in the group. Uh, it was perfectly acceptable for a man who was 27 and identifying as a woman to be dating a 17 year old trans man. And then that's what the because I think once we start suspending <laughs> our our values and our and reality on one level, it, it starts to cascade. It gets easier to suspend reality where, where boundaries any other else it, it would be obvious. That's an obviously boundary violation, but suddenly everything's just kind of no because it's flipped now. You know it's. They're right. women and they're men. And it's like, well, no, maybe it's because it, they're, it's not staying in reality of that. There is sex based um, issues with between women and women, right? There, there is sex based discrimination happening. And, and, you know, that's, that's just reality. And it's a matter of how many drugs you take or how many surgeries you take. Yeah. It will always be that way. Uh, yeah yeah and it's it's funny because it was almost like when i was talking to buck like she almost like got it a few times when i was like she was starting to really complain about she's like i'm tired of these you know trans women who are speaking over me i'm i'm and she almost said i'm an actual woman like she's like i'm you know i'm actually you know and i was like yeah a woman like you can say it. 
fuck? Because like I get that you like it's like you understand, yeah. and these are still men were fucking talking over you, and you know yeah. it's, it's, you're still. Oh, that's right. I saw someone mentioned in the chat, Chaz Bono. That was another one that kind of threw in and had other lesbians. Because Chaz was a lesbian and a very out lesbian for a long time. Right. I do think the hormones can, I mean, it's our sex hormone. So, you know, and they have an influence on our sexuality. And I think when we start messing around with them, it, it's just interesting how that can change the way that we, you know. Oh, like, she, I didn't know she said that her sexuality changed. Yeah. Well, but here's, here's the thing. How much homophobia did she grow up with? Cher was not impressed with a lesbian daughter. Right. Right. Especially a more masculine one. Right. I'm looking so, at the, uh I honestly don't know how much of it is the tea and how much of it is it just your own mind like fucking with you, right? Because we know that like subconsciously you can do you're you can do some crazy shit. Yeah. Yeah. And how so have do you know anybody who has has had like fallow or metoidoplasty? Like any of the bottom surgeries? Um, I, I know of of one one girl who had metodioplasty and she just you know she's she i think she really wanted to detransition but it's just not, she just can't like she feels and like she's gone too far anybody who doesn't know guy a toy and and the thing i've heard i've heard like i've heard of some women like i know there was a couple there was like two butch lesbians in california that had fallow and re and one did a video talking about regret and talking about wanting to go back but then retracted eventually and i think i can't blame her for retracting like what are you gonna freaking do at that point i know, you know? i know god no much and i also i also want to say that i am not without sympathy or i guess empathy for for buck and for like all of the like lesbian women who transition like i just have empathy for them still because i yeah. know where they come from but like i may have that empathy but i they still if you're active in the cult you're still doing harm and that right has to be recognized and that's also why i don't think within the lesbian community we should accept this as normal and okay right because it's not and it, it is it is a social contagion and it's spread like wildfire right you know which and lesbians have the right to be safe to be healthy to have bodily integrity without being fucking mutilated like you, they, we do not, we should not be co-signing the destruction of lesbian bodies, you know, because whatever, they're not fitting into some sort of fucking gender norm. Like that, that's a vulnerability, you know what I mean? And it's just sad. It's, yeah. I, you know, you're right. I, you know, it's funny because I, I, man, after I talked to her, I got to tell you, like, I just could not stop thinking about her for like the next couple of days. And I do, you're right. I have so much compassion, but it's like, and I was explaining this to my boyfriend. It's like, while I have so much compassion at the end of the day, I have greater compassion. Like there's too many other people who are being hurt by her rhetoric. And, and I think that actually forcing her to look at what she's doing and not sugarcoat it, could actually hopefully maybe save her life one day. Maybe finally, like, at least maybe plant the seeds of her being like, what am I doing? I'm continuing down this path of self-harm and addictive behavior. And, and, and other people have to see that like, everyone's like, Oh, she's my hero. What do you, for why? Why? So like you said, it's like a, a low bar to be. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, the, the other, I guess and that's one of the issues I've taken with like, it's why I left Twitter. I was just so frustrated with so much of the like talk on there about, you know, and and this is basically from the majority of people who are supposed to be like, you know, against gender critical. Yeah, gender critical, right? You know, all the big ones that are writing articles and talking and have shows and everything, all of them make exception for the true trans. All mm -hmm. of them make exception for the gender dysphoria. And I'm like, I feel throw I personally feel thrown under the bus. And I feel like you're still throwing people under the vulnerable people under the bus when you do that, because you you are still saying for some it's OK to hurt yourself. And I'm like, I'm saying it's never OK to hurt yourself. And this is always self-harm. I think it it's self -harm. all self-preservation. No, I that's why I really believe it's 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 a Trojan horse. It's very insidious. This true trans thing is a Trojan horse to sort of occupy gender critical spaces and get the narrative back under control to protect trans. So it's not yeah, the, 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 whole, the whole that's the first time I've heard about this idea was from you, I guess, the whole 
keeping the narrative under control. And I hadn't yeah. thought about that before, but that's actually, that might be a valid point. Like, yeah, that's, yeah. I, I really, I fully believe it. I fully believe it's all about self-preservation. Who Blair and White, what I'm going to go take this clip that you and I are talking about right now, and I'm going to make it short and I'm going to show you where Blair White literally admits it during his Jubilee interview. He said, and first of all, to all of you, I want you to know that you might be mad at me about what I'm talking about with gatekeeping, but you have to understand I'm fighting for all of us to preserve trans, uh, the trans identity. Yeah. You literally admit it. it. It's about trying to preserve it so it doesn't totally get wiped out and exposed for some the, the bullshit that it is. And the other thing you have to realize is this is a this is a drug. Like, if you look at the way that trans-identified people and trans advocates react to the idea of their hormones being taken away, I don't know if anybody's ever had drug addicts in their family. I've had quite a few. Oh, yeah. The similarities are striking. Astounding. <laughs> when, you, when you threaten somebody, when you call somebody out and threaten to take their drugs away, they lose their fucking shit. Bro, you know? that's the thing. And this is why I think Buck Angel starts to panic. I think she's a drug addict i think she's an active drug addict very much she says she's been in recovery for 30 years no you're not you're still taking recreational drugs and now it's testosterone and and, and you're still self-harming with that and I, that's what the you're right it's the sort of like like get away you know what i mean yeah like, there, really, there really is that reaction and that's that's interesting to me you know? yeah and i it's, i never even when i was um more on the fence or more trying to be like you know open-minded about stuff uh, I still would not engage with any of the true transsexuals that are in GC sections because I, I, I was like, I can't, I can't. Cause I, I think you are the same as everybody else. Bro, they are. I, the I only don't... difference, the only difference is what you're admitting reality. You're admitting reality and you're saying it's wrong to transition kids. I'm sorry. But when I was trans identified, I actually felt the same way. Mm -hmm. I was actually, I was actually okay with transitioning kids until I started transition. And then I like within several months, I was like, absolutely not. This is evil. Absolutely not. This is hard. This is hard on me as an adult. There's no way you could put a kid through this. So I but was against it really early. Circular, the circular, this is why I get mad at people like Buck Angel and Blair White who are like, I'm trying to save the kids. But then it's like, you're sitting here saying that, oh, but people can use can actually claim to be trans if they pass. And like Blair is like, you know, once you pass, then you can use the woman's room. He tells us bullshit. I'm sorry. Bullshit story on Jubilee. I fucking had to replay it and was like crying, laughing. I was like, bro, this never happened. He's like, and I swear it did. But I went into, I went into the, the men's room just to see. And within moments, I was thrown out of there. And I was like, see, I can't, even if I wanted to go into the men's room. They okay, just so I guess it depends where you're at, but like as a woman who, well, I have walked into a men's restroom and used it when there was no room in the women's. I'm like, fuck you guys. Like, right. there's no room. Okay. You know, and as a woman who's gone in and also seen other like very feminine women go into men's restroom, men are just like, what the, what the fuck? Yeah, they just like run away. Like they, they don't really say anything. I've never seen that happen. I've never seen men say anything. They're just like, oh, get the fuck out of here. I've they gone in know. looking like this, especially at like a bar where I'm like, fuck it, I'm going in. Yeah, like, yeah. the hell? And they're like, oh, and I'm like, sorry, not looking. I'm just going to be really fast and bounce. And they're like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so the fact that they threw him out means they probably knew he was a dude and they didn't want they didn't want a faggot in there yeah yeah no which, which you don't understand is a lot of the shit that you're that about these trans people are getting is homophobia it's it's homophobia and sexism it's not like transphobia is not necessarily where it's coming from it's coming yeah. from homophobia right because you're not supposed to no totally you know. totally totally yeah and it's you know and that's why i just i i, I get yeah, I get really frustrated with it. What what message would you send to any young lesbians out there listening to this who have been kind of struggling with ideas about their gender, getting fed some of this trans stuff? Well, first of all, I don't speak to just young lesbians. I speak to all lesbians because right, all I, lesbians. I do want to point out that this is a very underrepresented thing. And I, I can see why, because when you're an adult and you do this, you got a lot of shame. You're not going to talk about it. However, I've been in contact with many, many, many lesbians that are actually older, as old as me and older that transitioned late in life and have yeah. since gone back. So we exist and we exist across the age. So I would say to any lesbian that um, it's okay to stop. 
basically. It's okay to stop and it's okay to go back because that, that's, that's who you, that's your true self. Like you got to be honest with yourself. Yeah. Uh, And there's, there's something about, I don't know when I was, when I was trans identified in like, I guess, you know, passing as male for the most part, as far as I knew, I would see lesbians in the wild and feel this yearning because yeah. I was like, those are my people, but I can't be with my people because oh. I have shield. I have masked myself. basically. Wow. That's a really good point. You're like self segregating yourself out of your own community. And, yeah. and it's like when, when you need them actually more than ever, you know, and, and you're actually like keeping yourself from plugging into like where you need to be. Yeah. And I still um, felt, I still felt a kinship with yeah. lesbians right and and this is this so really that, you can hear in her voice i know like literally it's like almost like i feel like there's a part of her that's almost sad that she can't no i know i i, mm-hmm. I think i i honestly wonder if buck doesn't want to detransition and I hasn't think. for a while but doesn't because of the sunk cost fallacy and because she's and built she's a, a drug addict. industry well yes and because she's built a whole industry on herself right right and then how much do you think, like, what about, like, the sort of, like, sexual signaling part of it? And, like, what, what are your thoughts on my theory that, like, for, like, some gay men and and some lesbian women, it's like, you know, and I, I there was actually a gay man who kind of, like, validated what I said. And it was under a different, where did he say it? I forget where. But he was, like, I think, no, it was under your video. And I was glad because it validated what I said. So, and but it was, like, you didn't hear it from me. You know, but he was kind of echoing something that I had, like, uh, you know, hypothesized is that some gay men actually are attracted to straight men. Like, they want straight, you know, whatever. And it it might have to do with internalized homophobia or whatever the issue is. And it's like, you know, if I transition, I can expand my sort of, like, sexual market pool, which is setting yourself up for such, like, a heartbreaking failure because, you know... You're still not going to get like. Well, I, think, I think that plays a role in it because I mean, all homosexuals we have a very small pool of other people that we can like yeah. date and make relationships with and have sex with, and it's as a human that's super hard. Like, right? Yeah. That's a it's a very human thing to yeah. want, and when your pool is so small, I guess you do think, well, if I if I was straight, my pool would be much bigger, and it would. But you can't ever actually be straight, like right? Like because you know, you're, if you're still trying to date the same sex or be with the same sex, no matter, no, have no amount of surgeries is going to change that. No. It'll mask it, but it's not going to change it. Girl, I got to pee really fast. Okay. Talk to them for one second. I'll be super fast. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let me put yours on. Sorry, I thought I was putting you on. I know it's like the, it's like the story of my life. I had pelvic radiation. So my like bladder, I feel like is like a leather fucking pouch at this point. I get it. All right, bye. Um, oh jazz is sad jazz is really sad i could never even watch that show um i watched some of x lanzik's take on it and that was like enough for me that was that was horrible oh isaac hi um So yeah, my my big issue with the with the true trans thing is it's still upholding um, ideas in our society that I think are detrimental to society. Right? I really want to encourage people to be okay with themselves, to um, accept themselves, and embrace themselves. And I don't think um, buying into the tr- buying into that some people are trans will ever do that and i knew so there was a detransition woman who is very active in the trans community or um, was very active in the trans community and very active in the detrans community and she talks about how as long as transition is on the table you'll never fix the problem she really believes that you have to take transition off the table like especially with mental health like you cannot have transition on the table. No one will ever work on their issues if transition's on the table because that's the easy way out. They'll want to just transition. I totally agree. And that was a little bit of an, that's an extreme take, right? But I, I agree with her, right? It's like having, it's like having, you know, drugs on the table versus working on your issues. You're going to like, oh, I'm just going to take the drugs. It makes me feel better. Right. No, I, I actually, you know, even as early as like three weeks ago, I was like, no, that's ridiculous. And it's crazy. Like in such a short period of time, 
I'm actually with you. I just think no, because like, like we said, as long as that's there and we know it doesn't work. So what, why does it need to be there? It not only doesn't work, it, it it's destroying the health of people. It's doing more harm than good. It's, I don't know anybody who's like, I'm glad I had bottom surgery, man, that fucking fallow boy. Hey, it's really, I'm laying fallow, it down. Fallow was a horrible, horrible. I mean, they're all horrible procedures, Ugh. but fallow like, especially is just Ugh. like, as a woman who has sex with men, I will tell you, and I've said it before, if anyone pulled one of those things out on me, I'd be like, you need to back up. <laughs> Gross. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it, it's, 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 it's all these surgeries are is removing people's gen genitals yeah. and, and making them, it, it, they're making it impossible for them to have sex anymore. Yeah. And, and that's fucked up to do to people. Like it's really messed up to do to people. Could you imagine? It's like, and I always say, it's like for for a culture that is so fucking obsessed with sex, and and it's like we have such a bizarre relationship to it. And it's like sex is a wonderful thing. It's it's a beautiful part of adult life. It's how you you know you connect with someone that you love and build these relationships that you can you know, expand your life and enriching yourself, you know, and, and all these different things. And like I said, it's what made me a mother. It's what built my family. It's, it's this really precious, wonderful thing. And we just, we tr like, we just are so weird about it. And it's like, we're so obsessed with sex and porn, but then we're also like sterilizing and mutilating people and destroying their ability to orgasm. And I, know, like, I always thought it was doing? funny for, for a community, the trans community who's so like supposedly so sex positive, sex positive. Why do they want to take the ability of, of future adults to be able to have sex by, by, by um, sterilizing, by removing and damaging children's genitalia? Like, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, and, and damaging their ability to mature. Uh, into you know, Marcy, adult, you know, Marcy Bowers acknowledged, and I'm going to just say this every single video if I have to. Marcy fucking Bowers, who's the lead surgeon on the Jazz Jennings case, admitted that cross sex hormones, or I'm sorry, that, that pu Lupron followed puberty blockers, followed by cross sex hormones prior to Tanner stage two. So when they talk about puberty, there's different stages in Tanner uh, stage two. It's like, I, I forget exactly. I think there's like four or five stages, but prior to Tanner stage two, uh, that no person has ever uh, been able to achieve orgasm after that and, and will permanently have, will, will be incapable of orgasming for the rest of their life. I mean, isn't the point of mental health and, and medical, uh, um, the medical industry, well, it's an industry, but, you know, the medical community at its ethical core, shouldn't mm -hmm. it be about preserving life and health as much as possible at every, mm -hmm. at every turn? Like, that's your primary goal is to make sure that people are, like, healthy and safe. Yeah. I mean, as a society, I think we, we want that. Like, that's what we tried to build. It's um. Yeah, and, like you and, so, and that's why I say when it comes to mental health and health, no transition should not be a treatment. There's not there's not even enough scientific proof to have it be a treatment. If no. they want to if they want to bring the proof to the table, I might change my mind. Right. But bring right. the proof. Let's do it. Right. You right. know, um, I don't, and, and yes, it's true. You can't force people to go to a therapist and, and get help if they don't want to. That's right. fine. They don't have to if they're adults. They can go to the cosmetic surgery, but it shouldn't be a treatment. Yeah, you're right. It shouldn't be a treatment. If you want to make it some, you know, these like cosmetic surgeons and whatever, it's like, it's like selling cigarettes to people. You have all these warning labels and it's like, this is bad for you. And we're going to overcharge and tax you, you know, because you don't need this and whatever you want to damage yourself, like fine. But yeah, well, it's not, we're going to do it on, it's, we're going to do it. It's going to be on the same level as the lizard guy. You know, yeah. it's like, yeah. if you want to tattoo your face green, and I, I heard I heard Buck talk about how the reason it should stay in the medical field is because you used to have the the black market drugs and the 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 transsexuals doing horrible things to their bodies and not you know and that's disturbing and that's sad and I wish that wasn't the case. Right. But also, people do all kinds of fucked up things to themselves, and right. we cannot give people what they want to it's fuck like somebody like, who's like, performing by cutting it's like you know yeah, a, I mean, a girl who's cutting herself and it's like here we're gonna cut you in the doctor's office exact that's very like, good yeah that's a good analogy like it's like 
well, cut yourself safely. Yeah. Or how about no? no. <laughs> you, you can't. You know, that's a doctor shouldn't be part of that. No, I agree. I think that it's you know we don't have to legislate against people getting things, but we can legislate about what doctors are allowed to do. You know, what's, I mean, I, what's the ethics? I I don't think the ethics are there. I think it's very unethical, yeah. and the science isn't there either. And we're supposed to be based on science like that's the whole point proof and there's never been proof i mean like we're we're going off of the the ideas they have today is no different than they had 100 years ago and that's pretty sad because we've come a long way in a lot of other places i I just think with mental health and even like i hate to say it like aa which is way more benign than this aa is also not very like alcoholics anonymous narcotics anonymous which is way more benign and i do think it has like some helpful social elements but it's like our, our addiction treatment in this country in general is based off. It's like, just pray, oh, you know, God, keep yeah. on praying. I know. And it's like if you fall off the wagon, well, you weren't praying, you weren't, do, you know, you didn't work the system, like the program hard enough. And I was like, eh, you know, and like the success rate's not that great, but at least again, it's not like actively like doing all this, but it's like, I, I just think our understanding of mental health is just so deficient in general. And we, we just, the lobotomy we just keep coming up with all these like s- weird stuff for very complex the issues. the thing about the mental health aspect that i like don't understand because i think it's super easy pretty much when someone comes in with a problem you just start asking why you just have questions and you start talking about it and you come up with a lot of answers if the person's willing to talk you know like i i personally have found a lot more healing in um lesbian spaces and feminist spaces around Mm. just talking with other women about our issues because you know that has been much more helpful than i ever got when mental health as far as this issue you know Yeah. yeah yeah no totally and a lot of like whenever i'm kind of having like some mental thing it's usually because i'm not sleeping very well um you know i'm spending way too much time on a screen i'm not eating well i'm not exercising and it's like if we just start like at these more base levels and like you know de deconnect like you said i had to get off twitter good good you know there i i took like six months off of all of this because i'm like i need a break I'm, you know, there's just too much going on. I need to unplug for a while. And sometimes we have to do those things first. You know, they're not as glamorous as, as going and getting, you know, like a, a like arm skin fruit roll up sewn onto your pubic bone. But man, you know, it probably is going to do more for you and way less expensive. Um, and then I guess, you know, I guess my final question for you would be, um, you know, do you still struggle with any, um, you know, do you still struggle with any like feelings of just, you know, either dysphoria or discomfort in your body and what kind of, um, yeah, like how, how are you now? How's it going? Um, actually I never thought I would reach a point where I'm this comfortable. So it's really quite amazing. That said, yes, there, I still struggle you know, with certain things and it will flare up at times. But the, the key to managing that is to know why, to know where it comes from. And then to know that that particular situation is not me, it's the them basically, you know, cause there still is, you know, as going through the world as a butch woman, especially now we're like, good luck finding another butch woman who's actually a butch woman and not transitioned. Right. Um, you're going to run up against stuff that's going to make you feel kind of crappy about yourself. And instead of internalizing that as I'm wrong, which is what I used to do, I'm like, yeah, society sucks, you know, and I just try to move on with my day. Yeah. And having the support of good of, of lesbian community has been very helpful. And I think, you know, this is another reason that like the trans stuff is so has been so detrimental to lesbians, the trans trans advocacy and trans ideology has been devastating to the lesbian community, right? We cannot create community anymore without men thinking they belong there. Right. And that's been devastating. We've had to go underground again. And that's just lesbians have really got it the worst. And this is why I always said we had to, we did turf pride in July uh, via five, five, five. And I helped her and 
you know, for the first, we wanted it to be like an annual thing. And, you know, we made the first one centered around like lesbian pride because it's like, they were the first to really kind of get like kicked out to just be silenced and pushed out of once the whole like force teaming and the acronym thing. And they were the ones who are, I feel like hit the hardest um, you know, on like twofold, it's butch lesbians who are being, you know, mutilated and who are bodies are under attack, you know, from this ideology. And then also it's, you know, the whole cotton ceiling where you have these trans identified males, where it's like the ultimate trophy of affirmation is being able to push past the boundaries of a lesbian mm -hmm. and it's sick. And it's like, you know, it's wrong. And, and, and lesbians, we need to remember it was lesbians who were the first ones to sound the alarm. I never want to fucking hear some conservative man. Be like, Where, where's the, like, what is it? Like, we're the feminists, bro. Okay. Lesbians have literally been fucking screaming their heads off about this since the 70s. And everybody's yeah, I was gonna no say one's since paying the attention. Yeah. Everybody's just like, Durr. and they're like, oh, we think like trans is like dumb. It's like they're like, fucking thank you. Yeah. Also, yeah. just from my personal perspective, I, I stay away from calling it mutilation, especially yeah. with lesbians because well with women i just i don't like calling it mutilation because i mean most most women take issue with it so me personally i don't use that yeah and i just i just want to mention that because the majority of my friends are probably going to take issue with that they will be like no i hear and, you. And, and to be honest i also want to encourage that you aren't ruined you aren't mutilated. There is a total life after this. There is tons of women who will accept you and love you. And I have come across so, I mean, so much of our fear, like, well, I was married, so it wasn't so much of my fear, but so many of my other detrans lesbian friends' fear was, will, will I find a woman to love me or be in a relationship with me because I removed my breast and I took testosterone and parts of my body are different and stuff and gone. And that was such, such a big fear. But all of them have found women. Like oh, okay. all of them have been in relation, have found relationships. Some have gotten married. So it's, I want to say that the lesbian community, um, I think that the, the lesbian community, especially a feminist based lesbian community, which is a, you got to make sure you understand where you're coming from. The gender critical feminist based lesbian community is very accepting, loving, and generally caring about the women who come back. Yeah. And I want them, I want women to know that. I want other lesbians to know that there's community that will totally accept you. And, yeah. and, you will find love. It's, it's okay. <laughs> oh no, I love that. And yeah. And like, please, like, you know, I understand. And, and it's, I relate to that a lot. I know it's not the same, but I had, I was diagnosed with cancer in 2021. I talked about this a lot and I had to get pelvic radiation and I, I, you know, I tried to save my ovaries. I like had transpositioning surgery where I pulled them up into my, you know, higher up here. So they would be out of the field of radiation. And my biggest fear was that if I went into menopause, it's like they're like, you know, your fat distribution will change, like turn into like a potato and like your sex drive. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, wow. Okay. And it was like my sex drive was going to be like non existent. I'll never be able to make my own hormones. And like they were saying that my ability to like feel romantic love won't will be impaired. All this shit. And I was like crying for like three months. And I was like, no one's ever going to love me. And like, no. So yeah. I was like, I'm in a, you know, I'm in a relationship now and it's all good. And I'm, still get you know so it's like you know you're right like and i i don't yeah I, your bodies are but and also i think the idea of like being detrans does not mean that you need to go get more surgeries or fix something it's that's like, that's a big thing i also talk about is like um for me personally i'm not going to tell the women what to do if they feel like they have to do something fine but i really i i do encourage women to take a year before doing anything after detransition, after stopping, take a year before you do anything else mm -hmm. and sit with that. Because after that, you may find that you accept yourself as you are and won't change anything. And I refuse to change anything. Like yeah. I didn't, I refuse to have laser. I refuse to have anything. I refuse to hurt myself any further right. to make anybody else uncomfortable. I mean, to make anybody else comfortable, you right. know? Right. And so that yeah. you're fully female right now, like right now with, you know, whatever's been done or whatever, you are still fully 100% an intact female. You know what I mean? And, it's, and I think it's, the most radical act that a, les a butch lesbian can do now is just to walk through the world as a butch lesbian. Totally. It really seems to be the case. Oh, and it's like, that's what I'm saying. And it's like, we need you guys. Like, you know what I mean? There's, it's such an important part. I feel like butch lesbians 
you know, are such an important part of like the ecosystem of women. You know what I mean? Like I've learned a lot about like, you know, performative femininity and like so many other things, you know, from butch lesbians and who have challenged me on my own ideas about stuff. And it's like, it's been so important, you know? And like you said, I feel like when we transition, we kind of like, you know, uh, these women end up like self segregating themselves out of like this sort of community of women. And it's like, no, we, we need this whole spectrum, you know, it's, it's such an important like element. And like, it's a loss when we like, yeah. you know, lose these women in our community. And, and if so you go watch, you go watch most FTMs that were lesbian before they transitioned, they'll talk about this, even though they're still trans identified, they'll talk about missing yeah community. they'll talk about missing being with women and it's like you should listen to that voice and you should really think about it because you yeah uh, what is that telling you that's telling you, you are a woman and that's where you belong and that's your true self right right and there's a reason why you don't i was reading something on reddit where it was like this you know uh ftm who was like yeah you know i'm hanging out with all these guys and they're all sitting here talking about women. He's like, you know, and I, I'm just, I'm not one of these dudes. And it's like, yeah, because yeah, you're, you're not. not a man. Yeah, that's why you're like, this is weird. And I don't fit in. Like, you're not where you belong. And did you not hear it in Buck's voice? Like I, there were a few moments and I'll try to like make some clips as short where I really feel like she had these moments of like, totally like missing, you know, cause I think it was maybe cause I'm one of the first people who have talked to her and like, called her she her without doing it as like i'm trying to just get a rise out of you but i'm just like i'm not gonna call you him and i it's okay and you don't have to like agree with that i'm not gonna change it but i'm not doing it to hurt you or disrespect you i'm doing it to oh, affirm yeah affirm you because at the end i almost like i'd be disrespecting you to call you he him because you're a woman and it's good and i see you as you are and i embrace that and it's something that's like you're not well, one I, you I i personally do it more to un brainwash <laughs> yeah because the pronoun thing was a big brainwashing situation and i found the thing that disturbed me most and i made a video on this a while ago the thing that disturbed me most about the pronoun situation is because i got so conditioned to use male pronouns with masculine women basically butch women right. that when i detransition i still found myself struggling to not call the butch women i knew who were detransitioning he yeah. And I was like so disturbed by that because before this, it was the opposite. I couldn't call anybody the opposite of what they were. Right. Right. And that was very disturbing to me. I'm like, my mind's been fucked with. I don't like that. It's almost this like mass gaslighting where it's like when you're walking through the world and every single person is playing along with the delusion, you yeah. know, it's just like, it, it totally fucks with you. And I, I really do. I think there was a point where she kind of almost like, you know, like it, it just did something to her to be called she and for me to be calling her a woman and acknowledging that she's a woman. And she just had this moment of like, it, it like, you know, she like spoke out about the trans women, the trans identified males, how they talked over her. She's like, yeah, and I'm like I said, she was like, I'm a, you know, and like she wanted to say I'm really a woman. And it's like, I felt this moment of like yearning for, you know, and she even says, she goes, I look back finally at my time as a butch lesbian. I'm like, you still are one A, you know? And it's like, I, you can hear it in her voice that it's like, I, yeah, you're right. I do think there's a part of her that maybe does want to detransition. And it's like, but you know, so many people are riding on this identity yeah. of hers and they, they, it's like these parasocial relationships where it's like, people somehow find their identity in her maintaining this role and it's like god i can't it's just, i it's also i have i have a controversial opinion about the tr the uh, the good trans that are in the i honestly think most of them are doing it because it validates them as trans oh a hundred percent i i may, maybe they do really want to help the kids no i don't maybe they do but like <laughs> the bigger part i really think it has more to do with the fact that Everybody who's against you is actually for you now because you're real. You're true. That's well, a big validation. Legit, and I always, I said this, I said, you know, what's going to be now the next level of uh, affirmation is trans identifying males now becoming gender critical so that they can be rad femmes. Cause that's even, that's like even the next sort of cotton swing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right? It's like one space that men really do not make sense in. And it's like, they can somehow like get in there, you know, then, then they, and I, I take, I take huge issue with the gender dysphoria alliance. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, with Mars. Fuck you. I'm sorry. <laughs> fuck you. This gender. No, 
gender, you're, you're basically still saying that gender dysphoria means you transition, that that's the best option for you. And right. I'm sitting here saying, no, right. stop hurting people because they feel uncomfortable in their bodies. There's reasons. Right. Don't basically you're punishing people for having emotional distress over their body for good reason. Right. And how is that not still promoting childhood transition, even if you're not saying it, but people like, you know, Buck and Blair, they're like, well, you know, if you don't pass and you shouldn't be using those spaces. So you're basically saying, well, had you transitioned earlier and stopped puberty, you know, then maybe and you looked like me and you're twinky and small and all this sort of stuff. It's like then maybe, you know, you could have made the cut, but you're not making the cut. And it's like you, you, they're still saying it without saying it. And you're right. I think them being against childhood transitions because. Childhood transition is what was the most egregious thing that suddenly got a lot of people to wake up to how the dangers of medicalization. Mm -hmm. And if they can sit there and say that they're against it and, and all this sort of stuff, then they, like you said, they can preserve their access to these drugs. And it's like, well, you know, some people need the treatment. We, we it's just us, we need it, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, I think it's, it's, and I also, I, I also question people Parents, parents who are fighting this battle because their kids were trans identified and they don't want their kids to be trans identified, but then they, but then they give Buck a platform. Then they give other transsexuals who are the true trans and the good Did trans. You see that one woman? Do you not realize, like you're a parent, I'm a parent. Do you not realize that kids like do what they see yeah. as okay, not what you tell them? Thank you, you have to model good behavior for your kids, Thank not you. tell them to do it and then do the opposite. Thank you. And that's what's happened. I'm like, how are you? What do you think the message is to your kid when you're like, no, not you, but them okay? You're yeah. still saying it's okay. If you look at the difference to look at the difference between Buck's like curated photos where she looks like real, like passing and stuff. And then when you're actually like talking to her or you see these like candid videos of her and you see how like petite her frame is and, you know, her jawline and stuff. And it's like, she just sounds like Aunt Selma from The Simpsons who smoked like six packs a day. It's like, like testosterone does never really gives you a fully male voice. It's just because you don't, Not you don't usually. actually have the the anatomy to support it. There, there's actual like structural things. It's like all it can do is make your voice like gravelly kind of, you know, and deep. But like, well, I do notice it depends. Like uh, the younger you start, the more likely it is to get deeper. The older yeah. you are, the less it is. Yeah, that's uh, um, just a thing I've noticed. Yeah, but, um, yeah, exactly. And again, and that's why, again, it's like all this true trans stuff really does still promote childhood transition because it's like, if you really want to make the cut, you got to start early, but we're telling you not to do that. But we're saying the only way that you can get into opposite sex spaces is if you pass. And it's like, it's all contradictory. And it's really all to just preserve their right to occupy this space. They're happy to throw everyone else under the bus as long as like they can be like, well, we're the special good ones, you know? And it's, yeah, I don't, it doesn't make any I don't sense. believe that. I guess, um, any last, last thoughts? I know we got to stop. <laughs> I know. I know. I couldn't sit here and talk to you for like <laughs> hours, but like what, uh, and I guess what would be your message to Buck? I, I know I totally, uh, yeah. I, for the, for the record, too, and I do apologize, I could have, there were so many better clips I could have used, and I was like, fuck, but, um, you know, like, I mean, do you have, like, a rebuttal for her saying that, you know, you're just blaming her? I know we kind of touched on it, but, you know. Well, I mean, I think I think I did a good job in my video. I think if you watch my video through with, um, with an open mind to what I'm saying, you'll, you'll get what my point is. And my real, really, my point was that, um, humans influence other humans. Um, social contagion is not just a thing that happens to kids. Social contagion is a human thing that happens. And, um, trans ideology, uh, is detrimental to lesbian community. And Buck pushed trans ideology, especially within lesbian community, because she was so very active in LGBT spaces. And because she always talked about being a butch lesbian, that's going to click other butch lesbians into it. Right. Um, I was a butch lesbian and transition was the best thing that I ever yeah. did. What I did, but you have to make your own decision. Well, I mean, get that's it. <laughs> like, yeah, that's an out. <laughs> and that's bullshit. I mean everybody influences everybody. If I was to come to you and say, I found a cure for this particular horrible thing that you're experiencing, aren't you going to listen to me? There's a reason that you I and mean, I have a similar language and accent.
accent is because, you know, we pick it up from the people around us. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, my, my, start- my point was basically just to kind of, I was wanting to educate other lesbians on, on Buck's history and Buck's yeah. influence. That's all. And, and I don't know, I don't blame Buck for my transition, but I am, an, I am mad to a certain extent about her influence on me and the lesbians around but she me. lied at the end of the day you're upset that she lied about the reality of well, what she was would saying. you would you be mad at somebody who came out of a cult that was mad at the cult leader no no you're you know you're totally right and would, it's the, like, would, you, would someone tell that person well the cult leader didn't tell you to join the cult yeah they yeah didn't. <laughs> i mean that's that's it is it is a cult they they just stood up there and basically listed off all the things that i'm feeling from a very intimate place that no one has ever really addressed with me before and then said that you know she found a solution and that solution is boy it's wonderful and she's living the best life ever and you hear she said she was like you know i didn't have to because i brought up the whole thing i'm like because she was like you know transition was great for me i'm like yeah but is it is that true buck like weren't you saying that you fucking went septic and like you're like uterus fused to your you know, the other thing too like even when i was trans identified like i i really didn't i mean initially i did encourage it with others but then later on, as stuff started to happen to my body, I discouraged it in others. I was like, yeah. look, I, I did play the whole this. I did this. I did this. But if you can not do this, don't do this. Like, yeah. I didn't want other women to do it because right. I thought it this isn't great, you know. And I just don't understand that. Like, all the health problems that she's had and all the health problems we know that comes from this. She talks about atrophy. And like I did, I gave her credit for talking about it among FTMs because no one was, and we did need to know about that. Right. However, if Buck was being honest and really wanted to help women and other trans identified females wanted to help women, they would tell women not to take tea because right. that's what's destroying your body. Right. That's and the truth. Stop doing all these photo shoots of you. But they can't. But they and- can't because they're a drug addict yeah, <laughs> like no. because it's their drug they can't tell you not to take their drug i'm telling you it. addiction is such an underappreciated aspect of this and especially with buck it's funny because before she even admitted I, before i got to the point in one of her videos where she talks about her history of being a drug addict i was like this is such it's just like blinking red light like addict like i'm just seeing drug addicts written all over this and anybody who's been in 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 mental health knows that someone who has an addictive i i hate the use of addictive personalities i think every human can be addictive to something right. addicted to something right? right but someone who struggles with addiction will often get out of maybe a bad addiction for a better addiction right there is a switch i've yet to see a, an addict complete be completely clean of addictive behavior totally i think that there's actually a theory that like addiction is actually never goes away and each of us have a different size like i feel like everybody has even some predisposition to some level of addiction whether it's like i'm just addicted to drinking my coffee in the morning or i'm like you know it's like these things that i just i i you know and i get irritable if i can't access it or whatever it is or my like you know blanket that's something so teeny but it's like, we'll always have, we can grow it maybe, but we'll always have this massive addiction and you just have to be intentional about how you channel that, right? You can yeah. make it into a good thing, like where I'm becoming a workaholic, but I'm going to set boundaries around it so it doesn't <laughs> hurt my relationships, but it can make yeah. me really successful in what I do. Or I'm going to, you know, be a gym addict, but again, set boundaries around it so I don't go so overboard that I'm hurting myself, which is better than me drinking my fucking brains out every yeah, night. I had before. a friend, I had a friend that was a meth addict for three years and she switched it out for running marathons. Yeah. You know, as long and as she doesn't go too far with it and become like have an eating disorder or something. Yeah. <laughs> She's and okay. It, you know, it's still, a, you know, an addict sort of outlet. But yeah, we can re-transition it. But you're right. I think that it went from being like drugs and alcohol. She's like, aren't you glad that I'm functional? It's like, you're no, still, you, you you're still one thing for another. Yeah. And, and it's a well-known thing that the like eating disorder pipeline to transition is such a huge thing with, with, right. with women. It's such a huge thing. Like I basically don't know. I only know maybe one or two detransition women who don't have an eating disorder. Like that right. don't have that issue happening. And I even knew one who was like, not masculine, didn't have gender dysphoria, but the idea of losing weight 
with tea and gaining muscle was very enticing to her. Right. So like, you know, there's a lot well, of over. It's not control over your body at the end. And I don't know if you ever heard there was who what I think it was Kat Kens. No. There was someone on TikTok, I don't know if it was Kat or it was like another detransitioner. She said that she when she started to like she had been on like you know tea and she like started to realize it was like bullshit she she like wanted to like challenge her doctor so she went to an endocrinologist and first she had asked for um first she had asked for testosterone for she said she was a weightlifter and she wanted to be like do power lifting and stuff and they're like oh no it's bad for you they're, and they like listed off these all these reasons why taking you know injectables is dangerous whatever she said fine she waited she and like i think i don't know she went back to the same doctor or another doctor in the same practice the same endocrinologist and now asked for it saying that she transitioned they're like oh yeah, yeah. that's great it can do many good things for you and it was like a whole different story she just all she did was change her reasons for why she wanted tea. Yeah. So it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Basically, that's all it is. It's crazy. And there we have it, folks. So with that, <laughs> we will leave off. Carol, thank you so much for coming on and talking thank to you. me. Guys, I'm gonna post Carol's links. Uh, I'll post the link to her one buck, uh, you know, sort of breakdown video that she did. I think that's a really good place to start, and also her channel in general. Um, and then, uh, are there other ways to get in touch with you or is that the best way? Um, I'm on Instagram. Um, I got off Twitter, <laughs> but I do have an Instagram account. Um, the right, cool. same as sour patches, 2077. Okay, cool. I'll same as my, as my, um, YouTube account. Sour patches. Do I'll same. give you the links. I'll give yeah. you. Send me all the links. I'll put them in a, uh, in a pinned, uh, comment on this. Definitely check out Carol. I think, you know, especially for uh, like, you know, other butch lesbians or just other people, just anybody. I mean, I think you get bring such a valuable perspective to this and I'm really grateful to hear. And also, you know, thank you for the work that you had did talking about Buck. It really helped sort of like prepare me to talk to her. And um, yeah, I appreciate what you're doing. And thank you so much for coming today. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so. for having me. Yeah. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you, Carol. Bye, everybody. Love you guys. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.